about phases of matter and gases. It's going to be broken up into two sections. Phases of matter will be one, and then gases will be the second. The gas section will be the mathematical section, and the phases of matter will be a broader general discussion. So here goes phases of matter. One of the phases of matter, of course, is a gas. And to do that, we are going to be looking at the kinetic molecular theory. The kinetic molecular theory describes the behavior of gases. And there are a few assumptions that we have to agree upon that the kinetic molecular theory discusses. The following. First, gases are made up of tiny particles. Empty fi space fills the area between the particles. There are no attraction or repulsion of particles. Those gas particles can move and fill the, sp the space, but they have no interaction with each other. The collisions that gas particles have are elastic, which means they bounce off 100%. So one gas particle could bounce off another gas particle, or the gas particle could bounce off the container in which it, it's sitting. Particles are in constant random motion, and that energy depends on the temperature. As the temperature increases, the energy increases, and more pressure is created because of the more energetic molecules. As the, pressure, as the temperature decreases, the pressure also decreases because those particles are not bouncing around as energetically. And those collisions that those particles have, those gas particles have, with the walls of the container and with each other is what causes the pressure. So let's look at gases a little bit more. We did this in class, but if we depress and expand a plunger, we discussed molecular movement and pressure. And this is what we said. I'm going to try to draw it because um, I don't have a video attached to this, so you can't really see it. So we had a little syringe, and the syringe we had had a closed bottom. And in there is some gas. And this was a little um, plunger. So when this discussion says depress and expand the plunger and explain molecular movement and pressure, what I had you do was I had you um, make the plunger go further this way. That means depress the plunger. And expand the plunger. One of the times you made the plunger move outwards. And our discussion focused around what happened to those particles. When you depress the plunger, molecules continue to move, but greater pressure is created because those molecules hit each other more frequently. When we expand the plunger, there's more space for those molecules to move, and less pressure is created as a result. Diffusion, of course, and effusion are two ideas related to gases. Diffusion is the movement of one um, substance through another. In this case, gas. So the movement of one gas through another. So when I'm baking cookies, I can smell them in the other room because of diffusion. Those gas particles that are created from the cookies travel through the air and to my nose. And I don't have to be right next to them to smell them because it can travel through space. That space, I should say, not, not empty space, but through the gas of the air. Effusion is the movement of gas through a tiny opening. So let's say you have a balloon and you put a little pinprick in it and some of the gas seeps out. Um, and that is effusion. How can we calculate the rate of effusion? We used this formula, rate of one gas as compared to rate of another. And that equals the square root of the molar mass of gas B over the molar mass of gas A. So when we had two different gases, we can compare their molar masses and compare their rates of effusion. In general, the heavier the gas, the slower it moves. So if I wanted to compare the rate of how about helium to the rate, how about of xenon, we would take the square root of their formula masses and the inverse of them. So the, the mass of helium is actually down here, and the mass of xenon, which is 131, is actually up here. And then when I say 131, 
divided by 4, and I take the square root, I get 5.7. That is the ratio of the rates. In other words, helium is 5.7 times faster than xenon. So that's the rate of effusion. We can also measure gas pressure and pressure in general by taking force divided by area. The unit of pressure is a pascal, but usually we use kilopascals. And we are interested in the atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure of the gas pushing down on us. So here we are on the Earth. Earth is looking a little lopsided. And here's the United States. And here we are in Maryland. And the outer atmosphere, let's say, is up there. So there's a column of air pressing down from the edge of the atmosphere all the way to us right here in Baltimore. That pressure is called atmospheric pressure. And on the average, it pushes down with a pressure of 1 atm. And that has nothing to do with money machine at the bank. It means atmosphere, atmospheric pressure. It also equals 101.3 kilopascals. And that equals 760 millimeters of mercury. These three units all measure the same exact thing. They're just different units for it. So if one had to convert between atmospheres or kilopascals or millimeters of mercury, you would use those equalities to help you go between them. A barometer over here is a device that measures atmospheric pressure. When you're listening to the evening news, they will tell you the barometric pressure, usually in inches or millibars. just depends on um, the reading. The, you know, the um, station you're listening to. Sometimes the Weather Channel will report things in millibars. Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure is a very easy idea. And it says the pressure of the total sample of gas is equal to the pressure of gas number one plus pressure of gas number two plus the pressure of all the gases in that particular sample. So if I had the atmosphere, for example, which it, on the average has um, 101.3 kilopascals of pressure, and that would be the air, there are all different substances that make up the air, because it's a mixture. There's some oxygen gas, and there's some water vapor. That should say H2O. It looks like 20. And that's because I have the H there, pressure, H2O. and pressure of nitrogen gas, and all the other gases that make up air. So on the average, let's say it's 101.3 kilopascals. And I know that the oxygen has a pressure of, oh, let's say, 50 kilopascals, and water vapor is 2 kilopascals. How could we figure out the pressure of hydrogen or nitrogen if that was the only other component? pretty easy. We would add the um, 50 plus 2 to get 52, and then say 101.3 minus 52, and we get 49.3. So that must be the pressure of nitrogen, which would be 49.3 kilopascals, if those are the only three components. And then finally, which travels faster, oxygen gas? or hydrogen gas. With some calculations, you could, if you want to think about rate of effusion, or know the fact that hydrogen is going to travel faster because it's lighter. The lighter the gas, the faster it moves. So now we're going to look at intermolecular force. This is a force that is relevant to all solids, liquids, and gases. Intermolecular is a new term, but intramolecular is what we've already had. Intramolecular are like covalent or ionic bonds. These are bonds within the molecule. And we talked about molecular shape and all that. So we've already done intramolecular. Intermolecular, however, is a little bit different. Intermolecular are forces 
between neighboring particles. And there are three intermolecular forces. Dispersion force, dipole-dipole force, and hydrogen bonding. The next three slides are going to talk about those in greater detail. So let's look at them one by one. Dispersion force is the weakest of the three intermolecular forces. And what is it? Well, it is a brief misalignment of electrons within an atom or a nonpolar molecule. Now this brief misalignment, you'll notice here, here's helium atom, which has two protons and two electrons. You can see how the electrons in the first atom, number one, are opposite to each other in the picture. That means the two electrons are as far apart as they can be, which makes sense because electrons clearly do not want to be next to each other. But notice in helium atom number two here in, in um, the first picture, A, notice how these two electrons are kind of on the left of that molecule. Maybe during their movement, instead of being perfectly opposite one another, they get misaligned. There's this brief moment when they're both on one side of the molecule. What happens, therefore? Over here, the electrons are kind of bunched up over on the left side of the molecule. That makes this side of the molecule, you can see here, negative, and this side positive, because we have protons over there, and that's what's in the nucleus. Well, what happens? Well, this brief misalignment causes the neighbor to also move its electrons away, because it wants to have its protons kind of aligned with the neighbor's electrons. That sets up a weak force or a dispersion force. So the data dashed lines that I'm showing between these is the dispersion force. This first molecule kind of cozies up to the second one. It prefers to be um, aligned with it because positive and negative will attract. Now, that's a brief moment. This is a temporary situation. Whoops. Temporary. T-E-M-P-O-R-A-R-Y. Dipole. That means polar. So there's a temporary positive and a negative end, but then the molecule kind of realigns itself and looks like it did in the beginning. Then maybe those two electrons get misaligned again. And that brief misalignment causes the neighboring molecules or atoms to shift their electrons as a result, and then those things can have another dispersion force, another weak force of attraction. So th this added force holds the molecular structure together. That's what a dispersion force is. Remember, it's the weakest of the three. Now, moving ahead, dipole-dipole force, you will notice here's the dipole-dipole force that dotted line, kind of like the last one in dispersion force. But a dipole-dipole force is for a polar molecule. Some of you may have to go back and put the Lewis structures together to see what, what molecule is polar and nonpolar. In this case, it's always a polar molecule. There's always a dipole, two poles, positive and negative. HCl, which is the molecule here, is a polar molecule because if you were to do the dash diagrams, do you notice HCl, which is covalent, hydrogen and chlorine do not have the same attraction for the electrons. In fact, this side is negative and this side is positive because this atom is more electronegative. So we could figure out which part of the molecule is more negative and which part is more positive by just knowing the electronegativities. So in general, the electrons would be hanging out kind of near chlorine because it's more electronegative, and that's a permanent dipole. Because it's always polar, forever and ever. Now, the neighboring HCl, if the electrons are out here, that makes this more positive, and this more positive, and then again, I'm just 
just drawing three. There's more than three electrons for chlorine, but I'm just giving you the idea. You notice the negative electrons kind of hang out around chlorine, and of course that's quite attractive to the positive, uh, as a result, the positive hydrogen. So when HCl, uh, in a large sample of HCl, is um, sitting in a, in a container, for example, the chlorines will bend to be near the hydrogens because they are um, opposite charged. And this dash or dotted line that you see here is that weak intermolecular force. Now, that's the dipole-dipole force. The other thing that's interesting about this particular picture, it shows the covalent bond. An intermolecular force is always weaker than an intra molecular force. So the covalent bond, or an ionic bond, is always stronger than an intermolecular force. The last one is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a dipole-dipole force. So you already can see here the similarity to the previous picture. You notice how oxygen is more electronegative has a negative side. Hydrogen, therefore, is positive. It doesn't show it on this one, but it showed it over here. You notice the oxygen is attracted to the positive hydrogen of the neighbor. This dash is the hydrogen bond. Well, how is it different than a dipole-dipole? Well, it's not. It's, it's a dipole-dipole force with highly electronegative And that means it's hydrogen with N, O, or F only. So some of you might say, what about hydrogen with Cl? Or hydrogen with bromine? Or hydrogen with something else? The answer is a no, not a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen has to be attracted to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So sometimes if it's bonded directly to it, and there's a large sample of that same molecule, like H2O, then that's a hydrogen bond. And, and again, hydrogen bonding gives rise to lots of different properties. So, for example, water, H2O, is a hydrogen bond. That's the reason water has such a high boiling point, that it has a high surface tension and has other properties because of the way it's bonded and put together. Let's look at some phase changes. Now, we talked quite a bit about gases earlier. We talked about intermolecular forces. And we're going to talk about phase changes. These are the kinds of changes where you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas and back. Some of those changes are exothermic and some are endothermic. Some give off energy and some take in energy. The kind of changes that are exothermic are the kind that go from the gas to the liquid to the solid. This is the exothermic direction. because you have to start with a lot of energy and then release it to be exothermic. Gases have the most energy, and of course solids have the least energy. So exothermic, to give out energy, you have to start with a lot and end with less, and that is going in this direction. Endothermic, go this way. Energy has to be taken in for these changes to happen. Think of water. If I have solid ice and I want to make liquid water and then eventually produce some gas, I'm going to have to add energy for that to happen. Eventually, when I get to the gas, of course, I'm going to have to put some energy in, maybe even on my stove in my kitchen. That's endothermic. You might think it feels hot to you, but of course that's above. That's because um, the gas of water at 100 degrees Celsius is above body temperature, so anything above that is going to feel hot to us. There can be even liquid water that will feel hot to us, but it's endothermic, those changes moving from solid to liquid to gas. Endothermic changes are ones where you start with a little energy and you end with a lot because you've taken it in, thus endothermic. Vapor pressure and boiling. This is an interesting concept. Vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a liquid on the surface of the liquid pushing upward. Now some substances have a very high vapor pressure. Things that are volatile, things that, um, let's say like gasoline, things like nail polish remover, 
these other organic liquids that can vaporize and have a pretty strong odor have a very high vapor pressure. They can become a vapor really easily. Things like, um, think about some um, perfume. We would like them to become a vapor quickly because we want to smell nice. These things have a high vapor pressure. So vapor pressure, you can see here, is the pressure of the vapor pushing upward. And this upward pressure is what's caused when it tries to become a vapor. Now water, for example, has a pretty low vapor pressure. What happens when we increase the temperature? When we increase the temperature, the vapor pressure gets more. The material can vaporize a little more quickly. But what's holding all of this down? We have another force pushing down. This is called the atmospheric pressure. And remember, it pushes down with approximately one atmosphere of pressure. At room temperature, the material, like water, isn't boiling because the vapor pressure is less than the atmosphere. But when the vapor pressure equals the pressure of the atmosphere, the substance, whatever it is, can boil. And so you can actually have boiling water at room temperature by decreasing the atmospheric pressure enough so that it equals the um, pressure of the vapor. Here's a diagram. This one's in millibars that shows pressure and temperature. Lots of pressure and temperature relationships. So what kind of um, thing would you have to know about this diagram? Well, this diagram's an interesting one because in millibars, actually, standard pressure is 1013. It's kind of like kilopascals, but no decimal. Um, so not 101.3, but 1013. 1,013 um, is millibars. So that's standard pressure. The three phases of matter, of course, are solid, liquid, and get vapor, or gas. And this one is for water. And you can see that in this region, you have a solid. In this region, you have a liquid. And in this pressure and temperature um, combination, you have a vapor. How is it important, or how is it helpful to us um, to look at this kind of diagram? Well, usually what we're interested in is standard conditions. So let's look at, whoops, I'm trying to draw kind of a straight line, not too straight. Oh well. Um, but I was trying to kind of keep a straight line from the standard pressure. I'm going to try that again. That's better. Um, and it's showing what happens over the three phases of matter. So when we have a negative temperature, you see temperatures down here, at standard pressure, you can see the phase of matter as a solid, right? And then, right here, something special happens. The solid becomes a liquid. This line shows the melting point. And if we read it off, it's about zero degrees. That is the melting point of water, because this is a diagram for water. Then, above zero degrees, standard pressure, you notice we have a liquid. And I'm just moving along, moving along, and we keep moving. And eventually, we come to another important point, And you can see there's the answer right there. That's the boiling point at sea level. Now, if we, I'm going to just connect this. And I realize the diagram that I have here isn't really perfect. But if I drop a vertical line, sort of, <laughs> I have to make it bent because I think that graph isn't perfect, you will notice that, oh, the boiling point at sea level is 100 degrees. And then after 100, you can see the material beca can become a vapor. Now, what happens when we have a situation where we uh, change the pressure? Well, let me get red. All right, so let's say we have low pressure. Pressure is uh, affects vapors a lot. Not so much solids, but gases um, are affected by changes in temperature and pressure. So look at that. What happened to the boiling point at low pressure? 
you can see it's going to be less than 100, whatever it would be. And if we raise the pressure, let's say we went somewhere like Death Valley, California, where the pressure is greater than it is here in Baltimore, so this is high pressure, what's going to happen to the boiling point of water? Whoops. Anyway, you can see it's going to be greater than 100 degrees Celsius. So we can manipulate um, the boiling point pretty significantly if we change the pressure. So this diagram can help us figure out the temperature and pressure for a certain situation. What if we lower the pressure below 6.1? We'll call this super low pressure. Hmm. And down here, of course, the phase of matter we have is a solid. And then, if it goes like this, what do we have? Vapor. Th from solid to vapor. This is sublimation, where the material goes from the solid right directly into the vapor stage. So depending on temperature and pressure, we can have different phases of matter. There's the triple point, where the solid, the liquid, and gas can all exist at the same time. Special temperature and pressure conditions. And here is the critical pr uh, critical point. Sometimes books call it critical pressure and temperature, whatever. Um, critical point. The critical point um, would be the, the furthest out point over here. That means um, no amount of pressure. If I made the pressure super high, let's see, right here, could liquefy it because it would stay vapor. So no amount of pressure could liquefy the gas. That's what the critical point is. Sometimes called the critical point.